You and I are told increasingly we have to choose between a left or right. Well, I'd like to suggest there is no such thing as a left or right. There's only an up or down. This is the No Doubt About It podcast. No doubt about it. And now your hosts, Christy and Mark Runcetti. Wildfire. Welcome back, Mark. Well, thanks. It's great to be here. Back in town yeah. within about an hour ago, and now we're hitting the show. That's right. Yes. We're going to do our best at this. You were up in Angel Fire in the Northern Mountains today. We are working on, yes, various other little things Yes. that we'll have more details on in the weeks to come. Yeah. And, of course, and one other thing we're going to have uh, on Monday, we're going to talk health care. Mm -hmm. We're going to have special guests talk about health care. It's going to be interesting stuff. Somebody with an inside view going to be really cool. But this show is more of a grab bag, just all kinds of interesting things that, that kind of caught our attention throughout the past few days. Although we're getting a little bit of the producer stink eye from uh -huh. Ella right now. She's tired. She's, she's at the end of her rope. Well, I think most kids are starting to like – fizzle out because it's towards the end of the school year and they're just like their pro last projects are due their finals are coming they have tests before finals oh man i always love the end of the year long days you got you got field day field you know. okay listen guy what? it's not fourth grade right now okay oh, it is it. these guys are in high school but they have field day do they not they do have field day <laughs> yeah. which is and we unusual. did we didn't in high school we just had it in in, in elementary school you were praying that they still had field day in oh, high God, school i would sit up the night before staring at the ceiling waiting to figure out how i was going to smoke chris candon I mean, oh that's God. how it was going to go. Oh my gosh. It was going to go down that way. It's like the fact that this he's one is... of my best friends, but it didn't matter. Yeah, you were going to take was, him out. Of course, I was going to so take in, him and like, out. If you were in high school at field day, you'd be elbowing everybody out on the sand volleyball court. Is that yeah, what yeah, oh, sand going? volleyball would have been back to back to Days of Thunder or even back to Top Gun. Oh, you know what gosh. I mean? You're out there and you're highway to the danger zone. You're out there doing what Are you, you playing do. volleyball in jeans? Well, yeah, no shirt. Yeah, yeah. that's oh, how we did okay. it. No, it isn't jeans. how we did it. No. You skied in jeans in no. Vermont too, okay? Or what? <laughs> no, but I, I, we could have. I, I yeah, done you, you yeah. could have. All oh, right. it's the greatest. No, they're just they're just toast, right, Els? She's not even talking today. She's no, like, she's I'm not even going to talk. I've yeah. got a project due. Yeah. She's telling us. Well, no, her. she had like a home out of office. Like she won't even speak to us about no. it. She, she goes right to Ella's out of office yes. and we can't get in touch with no, her. No, she's like, I, you're lucky I'm here to do the show. Yep. That's, that's basically And I'll talk to you on the weekend. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. We'll I get, get her it. back this summer. Don't yes. Worry. Okay. Okay. So we have a lot of comments. I'm going to try to whip through them. Okay, yeah. All various shows. Okay. So it's going to kind of be popping around. But first one comes from Love the Boys says, how did you ever lose the election? It's beyond obvious. We need your ideas and willingness to fight for what's right. I couldn't agree with you more. I love it when my dad sends us emails. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's fantastic. Okay. It's so very nice. Thank you very much. That it means a lot, especially all the kind words. I do appreciate it. Um, the Atomic Mom, she's talking about this one, uh, the story we do with Carrie Lake. Yep. Uh, kind of flipping her side on the abortion issue. Right. And so she said she, meaning Carrie Lake, has done more damage to the AZ GOP than any other politician in my lifetime. I even grew up in Arizona during the Evan Meacham fire Symington era when it was completely crazy. Yeah. I think a lot of ours have convinced themselves, you know, basically the only way to win is to kind of flip the issue kind of thing. Yeah, so, to capitulate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I understand the point in that it's going to, it is going to be a case study in how to handle things or not handle things. Lake and how she's dealt with the abortion issue, mm -hmm. uh, President Trump to a lesser degree, but Carrie Lake really, really went out there and, and went pro-choice when she was allegedly pro-life. So we'll, we'll see what happens with, with how that with ends up shaking out. There. Yeah, only time's going to tell. It's going to be one of those things we're going to see how it all shakes out here in the next few months. Right. When yep. that primary is done. Yep. Um, okay. Sue Sale says, hi there. Love the show. Y'all just so normal and informative. Thank you and God bless you. God bless you too, Sue. Yeah, we appreciate God bless. those, Thank those you. comments. Those nice comments. And then <laughs> the blogged in bunch. Right. This was funny. This was in response to our girls teaching us slang. Okay. The Z generation, generation yeah. Z yeah. slang. Okay. Right. So she's talking in that. She said, come on, chat. That was a total L regarding the it girls t-shirt. You never said if it ended in a W. And it is so go ahead and explain what the a quick ex explanation on your shirt. Oh, the shirt. Well, the shirt was that I lost the shirt. I talked about losing the shirt. Um, Ella, we thought your favorite it, black shirt you lost. It is my favorite you, black shirt. Right. It's not like of any material value. It's not like an expensive shirt or anything like that. Right. But it's my favorite one. Ella, we thought Ella left it at school right. when she Ella, Ella was Ella was absolutely just laid bare over this thing because you said, "Listen, you lost my shirt at school." Ella then says, 
you know, I, maybe I did. You convinced her of it, basically. Well, no, and I then, tore apart her room with her, and we couldn't find it here. Right. Okay. So Christy <laughs> shreds Ella. I didn't. Ella shred then believes Ella. she's done something wrong. Ella says maybe it ended up at Savers because at the end of every week at school they go to Savers. So being the maniacs that we are, Christy says, "Take me to Savers." <laughs> so we go to Savers on the west side. Christy looks through all the black T-shirts at Savers, comes out. Fired up saying, my t-shirt isn't there. My t-shirt isn't there. Oh my gosh. I didn't, you're so dramatic. You make this sound- it absolutely like a, happened. This is like your shirt, Ewing Oil. It's like you're creating a soap opera about me and my shirt that didn't actually happen. Listen. But yeah, I think, that if, hey, have you ever missed, lost something and you went on the hunt for it at like Goodwill okay. or Savers or those things? Okay, because- so she turns the house upside down. Everybody is accused in the house. Oh there gosh. isn't anyone that gets away with it. Poor Ella is literally in the police department <laughs> crying and writing a confessional, confession letter, <laughs> except for, oh, guess what? Guess what was dancing around all along in the laundry room? It was not in the laundry room. I will say that. I tore that apart too, um, but it appeared in the laundry room. That's okay. all I'm going to say. All right. I don't know how it appeared. Yeah, I don't either. So maybe next time, don't blame stop me on lighting this one. everybody up in the uh, meantime. Let's just say that it mysteriously showed up in a very empty laundry room. Okay, so now Christy is blaming again. I'm not blaming somebody anybody. Else Who is she blaming? I, it sounds like you could be blaming our other daughter, Ava. Is that true? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna <laughs> plead the fifth right now, and res- out of respect for my kid. But uh, you can't plead the fifth for someone else. <laughs> oh, I'm pleading it for myself. I'm pleading it for myself. You can tell I do a lot of court stuff, oh, right? Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm really gosh. big on that. Okay, oh, yeah, but anyway, yes. Yeah, so okay. it was. It did end in a, a win because I got my shirt back. So. Okay. Anyway, that was ridiculous. Funny. Um, but anyway, all right. Okay. Sam Cerna says, we have open borders. This is back to our, when we were talking about the cartel coming in. Yeah. Um, he says, we have open borders. We will get attacked from within the U.S. We've forgotten what happened that September morning. We need people like you with a good agenda to prevent childish stuff that's been happening over the past three years. Oh, wow, that's very nice, Sam. Thanks. But I, when we look, I think enough people in this country are realizing what's, what's happening here. And it's my hope that we're going to change direction on it. Gosh, so. I hope so too. Yeah. Um, Richard Taylor wrote in, said, thanks for the report on Israel. Yeah. Uh, this was our show from last week or from Monday. It said, I was praying, but I don't watch the news. So it's good to know that they were protected. Okay. So this is what was interesting, right? And there's definitely a spiritual portion of this. I, I think that we fall on those lines too. I think this country has a unique role in helping to protect the nation of Israel. And I think we've taken that role seriously. And I think presidents from both parties have cared about that and and done a good job. Um, But I want to get to one thing in particular on this, and that is that, so I was looking through the Wall Street Journal as we're getting ready to go, and they had an interesting, couple of different interesting articles, but one was on the fact that as we go back and look at the technology that was used a couple of days ago to make sure that 300 rockets, while launched from directly from Iran to Israel, in an unprecedented provocation, not one of them that we can tell hit Israel, or at least not you know unmolested all the way into Israel. Mm-hmm. It, you know, maybe pieces of it may have may have hit places and stuff like that. Well, if you go back to what Ronald Reagan talked about in 1983, it kind of came to fruition, which was everybody remembers the Star War. Everybody talked about Star Wars mm-hmm. at that time, and that was kind of the derogatory name that Ted Ted Kennedy used for the Strategic De- Defense Initiative. Excuse me. And and what what that is, is, is the strategic defense initiative was Reagan basically talking about shooting ICBMs out of space so that the, so if Russia launches one to hit the United States, we have basically a, an iron dome of our own before any of this, you know, was came to reality here over the past few days. So this was something Reagan was talking about in space, shooting them up in space, which now what we've got is a bit of a hybrid system, a lot of its surface to air, but still his overall mission of making sure that we can protect either ourselves or our allies from missiles that come from another country, that came to fruition. And and the story was interesting in what it said. And it said in 1983, President Reagan in a televised speech proposed what he called the Strategic Defense Initiative. Its core idea is that the US would build defense systems that could shoot down nuclear armed ballistic missiles from the Soviet Union. Democrats and much of the defense establishment mock the idea with Ted Kennedy calling it Star Wars. So what did Joe Biden say about it? 
Well, he said, Star Wars represents a fundamental assault on the concepts of alliances and arms control agreements that have been buttressed with American security for several decades. And the president's continued adherence to the to this constitutes one of the most reckless and irresponsible acts in the history of modern stagecraft mm. or statecraft. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, once again, Joe Biden is exactly wrong. And he's the one who benefited from it. He's the one who benefited from Reagan's vision mm -hmm. to look out and say, we need to have this type of protection and it's got to continue to advance. So single biggest reason that Reagan is my favorite president of our lifetimes and of all time, because he was a great communicator. But number two, he was very clear in the things he thought. He thought we need to have better national defense. We need to give people more freedom and more power over government versus government power over people. Mm -hmm. And he did it all the time. And then the results of his presidency are un. Matched. They're yeah. unmatched still, really. Yeah. I mean, he's, really I still think he goes down as the best president in our lifetime. Oh, it's not close. It's not even close. It's not close in our lifetime. And I think he's top five all time. Yeah. So whether you like President Reagan or not, or, or whether no matter what party you're from, it's hard to argue with when he came into office, he took over an economy where you had gas lines, sky high inflation, yeah. and interest rates that were in the double digits. Mm -hmm. We had the Soviet Union, which was closing in Breathing on us. down our neck. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. And, and that economy as a whole, we were getting crushed. And by the time he left office, the Soviet Union was toast. We had the best, strongest economy in the world and the strongest national defense in the world that we have not given up since. So it is hard to argue the, that list of accomplishments. Right. It really is. So Yeah, we anyway. need another Reagan, everybody. Yes. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, okay. Okay. So the economy. So where are we on the economy? This is interesting. Numbers keep coming out. So, so here's some of the latest stuff we're talking about here. Uh, growth, inflation, and interest rates. I just wanted to kind of put all this into a bow and, and to give you an idea of what some economists are saying. Now, what, what are we likely right, to see? Because they're saying, hey, it's getting better and you know the economy's great and you don't need to panic anymore and everything's great. And then we're not so much feeling it here in our pocketbooks. Right. And, and the question becomes... What's happening with things like growth? Okay, we're seeing good growth. Why is that? And, and the biggest reason we're seeing significant economic growth is the fact, and most economists uh, agree with this, is that we're seeing a ton of government spending. So government is pumping a ton of money into the economy, and that economy is continuing to grow. So you say, okay, economic growth is fine, but you're, that economic growth is happening because we are putting government money in the middle of it. Right. And that's what's really fueling all of this. So the question becomes, how much does that really help us? Right. If it's all deficit spending. Right. Government money. So another thing we're looking they were looking at is the labor market. And they say that job gains have also far exceeded forecasts, but possibly owing it in part to the immigration fueled increase in population. Economists still expect a slowdown to come imminently, if only because business have exhausted the pool of available workers. So that's interesting. You know, are we seeing an influx of, you know, more people working? Um, I didn't know that uh, people that were here through immigration are counted in that. I guess I don't know. Well, why. sure. If, if you're if you own a business and you add ten jobs, they're they're not they don't know who's filling those jobs. Right. They just know that, that you've added those to the roles, and and so that's an issue. It's interesting. So if you look at the total amount spent, that's going up because of government spending. Some of this is fueled by by people uh, coming in and filling these jobs. And then beyond that, there's also inflation mm -hmm. and the inflation portion of it has stayed stubbornly high because stubbornly, yes. right, because uh -huh. we continue to pump in a tremendous amount of government money. Of course, there's no doubt. So the Fed wanted to, by raising interest rates, bring down inflation. They've had trouble doing that. They've done it to some degree. Economists, however, modestly have increased their 2024 inflation forecasts, even before the latest hotter than expected price data. Jeez. So again, you're still pumping a ton of government money in. So we're still seeing prices stay high. So that's why I think when we look at this whole picture and we say, why do people think the economy is worse than the numbers suggest? That's what I'm getting at with this story. And it is because government money is fueling the growth and then potentially new people to the country, whether here legally or illegally are filling a lot of those jobs. Right. And so that's an issue as well. So inflation remains pretty high. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, this is going to end up being, I think, one of the biggest issues in the campaign. Right. Well, we'll see if it, if things, anything gets lowered or 
you know, we're seeing the, hey, let's remove college debt, uh, you know, debt forgiveness, all that stuff right. starts to trickle back in. It's an election year. It's going to be interesting to see if there's any other major changes that we actually, you know. Well, and, and I think see. you will you will see more of that sort of thing. This is a, that, That's a giveaway because Biden understands that that's where his votes come from. Right. It's right? just a straight giveaway. Yeah. You know, to, to his votes. voters. Buy yep. votes. Yep. Okay, so speaking of, like, who's involved politically these days, this is a pretty interesting story. I think that some of you out there will appreciate just this information because I thought it was pretty it, – it was not what I expected, actually. Yeah. And so this came um, through Twitter, and it said, friendly reminder that the group that is the most politically engaged is atheists. Now, this is a survey that was done. No, Brian and, Berg did it, yeah. Yeah, Brian Berg did it. And it says atheists engage in about twice as many political activities as cool evangelicals. Because 50% of atheists made a political donation in 2020, and it was t- – and, uh, and then out of the other group, it was only 26%. So, Ellis, let's put up the graph, and you can see this. This is an interesting graph because you'll see. Now, uh, what you see here are these little circles, and if, you, if you're just listening, we'll explain it. Basically, it goes from the right-hand side of the graph, most politically engaged, all the way to the left-hand side of the graph, least politically engaged. And this is what you're talking about. On the right, most politically engaged by far are atheists. And those who are Jewish, they're next. And then you keep going down. And then, Ella, if you just kind of focus in on the left-hand side of the graph, unclassified folks, white Catholics, Muslims, white evangelicals, Mormons, Orthodox, Hindus. So they went through a bunch of different faiths here. But notice, the farther left you go, the less engaged you are. Well, if you look at, say, white evangelicals, Um, Hispanic evangelicals and black evangelicals or Protestants in this particular case, they're far less engaged than those who are atheists. Which That just kind of surprises me. And I wonder, are they just so fed up that they think it doesn't matter anymore? Or I wonder what the thinking process is on on the, on the religious side. Yes. On the shifting back that if they think, well, you know, we've done what we can do or I don't know. I I think think, think, you see it all the time when you go to churches, when we would campaign, you talk to pastors who'll say half the people you're going to talk to in this room aren't going to vote. And you go, are, are you kidding? Yeah. Is, is that really possible? And it happens all the time. And in fact, when, when you look at in, in atheists, they are very engaged. And then if you look at where they tend to cast their vote, Ella number 17, what they tend to cast their vote. And let's just pull this up a little bit here. And you can see the numbers. They are 69% of atheists uh, fall in the Democratic Party. S- some, yeah, 17% basically have no lean. And then Republicans, about 15% of Republicans are atheists. So that shows you where this goes and in, in, in where some of the parties go when they try to figure out who they're talking to and who their base is. Yeah. And you see that. And, and so I just think something we've always talked about, that, that folks of faith, whether it be, whether you be Catholic or Protestant or, or whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. But you have to be engaged. And I don't care how you're engaged. Get engaged because your values matter. Right. And we've got to the country. We and here locally, we have a primary coming up June 4th. You know, hopefully people are actively getting out there to vote for your state legislatures, to put cast for your state senator, the folks that are running for state senate, and the folks that are running for U.S. Senate also too. Well, right. And those now those won't be involved in the primary, but it will be an interesting general. Right. Right. Neither one of them do. But but yeah, absolutely. We really need people to get involved, whether it's the June 4th primary, which is coming around the corner, um, to be able to vote for people that you want to see in our state legislature. That would be very important for you to show up for those kind of things. Um, It doesn't take much to get involved, especially registering to vote. Uh, I do see some churches still having people register inside their yeah. foyers and getting people involved that way. So I take that as a very positive thing. I don't think it's it's regardless of party, get involved. And But don't forget, this whole thing has flipped in the respect that it used to be low propensity voters, voters that vote, say, only in presidential elections. That used to always favor the left, Democrats. And now that's totally flipped. In fact, a, a, an article from the Colorado Springs Gazette talks about this, that Republican voters now are the ones who tend to be more reliant on the low propensity voter, the voter who who will only vote for president, for example. Mm -hmm. That tends to be a better election for Republicans. Republicans then really need bigger turnout, where it used to be, you know, Democrats would always benefit. The more people who voted, that benefited Democrats. That's no longer true. Now it is the more people that vote, that benefits Republicans. They have the lower propensity voters. And it used to be that Democrats were the party of the working class voter, uh, lower educated, and maybe didn't show up to polls as much. It's completely flipped, too. Now, Republicans tend to be 
the party of the working class voter. Democrats right. tend to be the party of the higher educated voter. So these things are, are sliding back and forth. And what were the rules at one time? They aren't the rules anymore. Right. And that's why I always ask people, like, I really wish we could just rename the parties. I know we can't do that. But it is interesting that if you really ask people, why are you a certain way? Like, why are you Republican? Why are you independent? And why are you a Democrat? Or why are you not involved? If you actually start listening to them, a lot of them is just like, this is the family, this is the family gene. This is what we do. Right. We've all voted this way our whole lives. My grand, my great grandfather voted this way. I'm voting, you know, it's just kind of an interesting because. It, because it's all changed so drastically that really the parties don't even really, they're not really recognizable at times by the people that were originally voting, you know, 20 years ago in those parties. So yeah. anyway, yeah, I, just pay, think, yeah, I think you're exactly right. But it, it, trying changed. to get through and teach people and and have people pay attention to that seems to be more challenging nationally than I had. You know, I just didn't think I thought more people would get involved, I guess. Well, it, but they're, they're busy. Things are drowned out. If you look at where the sources are of information, th there aren't these sources of information you know you can go to. It's trickier and trickier now as it's broken down into more partisan leanings. As you have, uh, and we're going to have a story on this in a second from like NPR, for mm -hmm. example. A lot of people used to when I was growing up, and, and admittedly, I grew up in a in a pretty blue state. But but people would turn to NPR from both sides of the aisle, and and now that doesn't happen anymore. Right. Right. And so the people are siloed into these things where you are completely surrounded by beliefs that reinforce your priors. Mm -hmm. So you just listen and you think there are no other sides. Right. And you're like, oh my goodness, well, I, this is clearly how everybody thinks. And and somebody next to you is like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I don't agree with you at all. And so therefore we don't cross paths enough and we don't exchange enough ideas and, and effectively argue with each other enough to be able to say, wait a minute, I didn't think about it that way. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, you become more siloed and it becomes more and more difficult. And that 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 bears itself out in results from Senate races and presidential races. They tend to stay in line with each other. If a state votes for president one way, they vote for their senator the same way. It is really tough to break that off. I think eventually it will go back again, but for now, being a senator of a different party than voted for the president of that state is really an uphill climb. Uh, you know, if you talk politics, you feel, it feels heavy. And yeah. it feels like a weight that you don't want to take on. And I get that. Like, you know, the whole don't talk about your religion and politics. And we're drawing both on our show. But yeah, anyway. We're big like that. Yeah, we're big like that. But but I can understand that people just want to break away from that. And they don't want to dive in and pay attention that much because it's easier to focus on something else. It is. Yeah. And it's probably better for your mental health at times. But I think it's valuable and very important to know enough of the top line items so you know how to cast a vote and yep. you and you keep in mind that it's our job to educate the younger generation to also get out to vote. So oh, no, no great. But if you but if you think your faith of any kind means that that you know everybody that thinks like you is out there voting, they're not. They're yeah. not and it's an issue. Well, Hollywood is making news rounds here in New Mexico with something that we can't seem to get it out from underneath. Okay, yeah, it's the story of the Rush shooting. Mm -hmm. So Rush is a movie that was shot up in Santa Fe a couple of years ago. Uh, during that time and during one of the scenes, Alec Baldwin pulled out a gun he thought only had blanks in it, aimed it at uh, cinematographer Hannah Hutchinson, shot her and killed her. Right. So there was a live round in there, and there have been – Trial since, and the first trial was for the armor, the person who's in charge of the gun, making sure that it has blanks in it. And, and in fact, it didn't have blanks in it, clearly. So Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, who was the armor on the Russ set, was convicted. Mm -hmm. And she was also sentenced to 18 months, which was the max amount yeah. that she could have gotten for this, uh, which is interesting. It's an interesting dynamic that um, they went really hard on her yep. in a state in which we let a lot of violent criminals get away with things and they don't serve the time or they get out early or whatever. With this max sentence, she has to serve 75% of her time um, behind bars. That's yep. that's the deal with this one. And obviously I understand there was a consequence that needed to be paid, um, but it's just an interesting dynamic that um, here's a girl, 26 years old, her family, she came from a family of armors and and I don't know what the whole gist was. The one thing that stood out to me on this case that I think was interesting was 
she brought live rounds onto the set. And apparently, that's a huge no Oh, my gosh. Like, which I, can't I can imagine. only imagine. Right. So I don't know if she just accidentally brought. I don't know. I, you know, was it, obviously it was negligent. It ended in somebody's life. The other argument now is, did Alec Baldwin pull the trigger? And well, he's saying he didn't because in Hollywood, which this also sounded weird to me, but I read all this, that you they basically fake pulling the trigger when they shoot on a shoot a gun. I, I can't imagine that the gun fired itself. No, but uh, right. but but there are a couple other things here. First of all, Reed's part of her issue was the fact that she was recorded on a jailhouse telephone call calling uh I think um her attorneys. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, no, but she was she she called the the jurors idiots. Right. And and so I don't understand these people who think they're on the phone in a jailhouse phone call and no one's listening. Right. Hey, I'd hate to give advice to people in these situations, <laughs> but guess what? Everybody's listening. And apparently she didn't have a whole lot in the way of contrition for this whole thing right. during this process. So that could have contributed to the 18 months. But the person who should be really concerned is Alec Baldwin. He's going on trial over the summer here. Right. And one thing I didn't realize, and people put out a story on this, that this is probably going to be a wake-up call for him because the judge who handed down this 18 months, she's also the judge in the Baldwin trial. Right. So he has you know reason for concern there. There's no doubt. Now, a couple other quick things about this, because I think it was an interesting story. And one of these things that came from uh, the story in People, and that is, did you know he was offered a plea deal? Right. So he was offered, and this plea deal is interesting. Okay, so here's the terms of the plea deal. Under this plea deal, Baldwin would have been given six months of unsupervised probation for misdemeanor handling of a firearm and a fine of $500, 24 hours community service, and ordered to take a gun safety class. That feels to me like more than, you know, very easy to, to do. Now, I'm okay, not Okay, but do you know why it was pulled? No. He was working on a documentary about the shooting. Oh, yes. Okay. And so they pulled it. They pulled the plea because they found out about this documentary. Yes, where he was interviewing people that were going to be in his witnesses, and if he went, if he actually got to, had to go to a trial. Yes, so Alec Baldwin <laughs> has a sweetheart plea deal on the line, and then decides to do his own documentary on a shooting that cost a cinematographer her life, and then it ends up, as a result, pulling the plea deal for him, and now he goes on trial. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable! If you're Alec Baldwin right now. I mean, how could you do this? And, and again, it, this just looks so calculated. It's brutal. And now he's getting exactly what he deserves, which is a full-on trial. And he's going to try to make the case that he didn't pull the trigger. I know, which sounds really bizarre to me. I would think that, yeah, who knows? You have to have film of that, I'm sure. I thought this was interesting. In the article, it says, she notes that Morrissey claimed in recent court documents that the Emmy winner, meaning Alec Baldwin, has an impressive level of arrogance. And I won't go into my story, but I've had a minor uh, deal with Alec Baldwin. And I what can- What do you mean you're not going to get into it? What is it? So what is it? Will you just sign an NDA? And no, 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 no. But I, I had a brief encounter with him. I lived in Los Angeles. I had a brief encounter with him. I knew somebody who worked with him professionally yeah. and he lit this guy on fire for no reason that was working for him professionally. And I was a witness to that Yikes. explosion. And yeah. it was in, it was just, in, I was shocked because I thought, oh, here's this guy that I like in the movies. And no, he has a wicked temper. Well, uh, no kidding. Yeah. Like explosive <laughs> yeah, temper. I agree so the fact that she said he had a, uh, an impressive level of arrogance. That is, is not, so that's really funny. Me. That's actually a really funny character. Yeah. It's like, but. holy moly. Yeah. You got that right. Anyway. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. We'll to see how it shakes happens, out. Uh, with that situation, yep. but yeah. Okay. A couple other things here. I think we're seeing an increasing trend in this country of the type of protests, which are hugely concerning for a couple of different reasons. Take you to clip 28, Ella. It's libs of TikTok. In New York City, a pro-Palestinian protester lit an American flag on fire while another protester held a sign reading, free Palestine or else. Other protesters were spotted waving a Hezbollah flag, which again, a terrorist organization. That is clear. And chanting, death to America. This is what the video of that looked like. And again, talk about changes in this country. This is the sort of thing, I'm sorry, this is ridiculous. Yeah, it really, it's it's appalling to watch this go down in our country. I feel like, I don't know, I felt like after 
we had this rise again in patriotism. And I, I just have seen it slowly deplete itself. And to the, to see that somebody burning our flag, I thought that was against the law, by the way. No, I, it's not against the law. You can look, you can have free speech, okay? But but when you start to have a country where, where you literally have people within your country who hate it, they hate our country. Yeah. And, and then so, get out. Right. And That's it, my feeling on it. Get out. If you don't like what we stand for in this country, get out. Yeah. I agree. And, and, but it isn't just that. So what we've, what we've started to do here is we've seen more and more of these protests. So the, the, the latest protest was at O'Hare airport right, right after, right after Iran finished firing 300 missiles into Israel. Naturally, we, we would expect that let's stop air traffic at O'Hare. Right. Uh, good idea. So, so these guys go on a road and they stop this, this air traffic basically, or excuse me, a road into the airport, into the airport. So people literally had to get out with their bags and go walk the rest yeah, of the way here. Yeah, walk the rest of the these, way up. Now these, this is different. This is different because this isn't free speech. This is you're interrupting the everyday flow of traffic. These people all should be immediately arrested and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And it's not just that. Also, if you go over to San Francisco, they got on the Golden Gate Bridge and they stopped the Golden Gate Bridge traffic as well. For hours, right. people and, are sitting there. And they do it in New York City. My understanding, again, is in a protest, you have the right to assemble and you have a right to say what you want to say. But it's illegal to take anything onto a highway of and block traffic and things of that right. nature. So yeah, again, absolutely. why we're not, I mean, I, I don't know what the cop's response was to this. You know, I'm sure they were there, but obviously it took hours to clear these guys out. Yeah, miles, miles and miles of backup. This is the kind of stuff, if you don't drop the hammer on this and arrest people and prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law, like we have in other situations that people love to jump all over, Right. jump on this one and stop this stuff. It's, it, it is going too far. And you're not just seeing it here, not just seeing it O'Hare or in New York City, but in Bakersfield, California. Yeah, this woman is, uh, she, I mean, had, she had a lot to say to the city council and to the mayor. <laughs> she did. So so this is, she's an anti-Israel protester. And she goes up and her name is Reedy Patel. She's 28 years old. She goes in front of the Bakersfield City Council. Now, Els, we're going to pull up the sound on this if we can. And or we, we have partial recordings of this. She also, at the end of this, straight up threatened to kill everybody right. on the Bakersfield city council. But here's, and she uses some serious language. She so. does. So in, in this particular one, I think it was a cleaner clip that we've got here. Let, let's, let's listen to what Rudy Patel had to say. I know that you guys will vote to increase police funding. And I understand that you guys are all horrible people, but the thing is, 2,300 people being evicted in the last year, those are votes. And you guys, those are votes to win here in Bakersfield. And while you, you guys parade Gandhi around as a Hindu holiday called Chaitra Navratri it starts off this week, I remind you that these holidays that we practice, that other people in the global south practice, believe in violent revolution against their oppressors. And I hope one day somebody brings the guillotine and kills all of you mother. Yeah, and she basically, I guess she got all mad later and also talked about that she felt like she was there to to yell at the mayor and the city council because they had installed extra security measures like metal detectors in their buildings, and that went against the protesters. And she, Well, yeah, and she also said, what you didn't hear there, she also said, we're going to come to your house and kill you. Like, yeah. she said that. So she's been charged with 18 counts of threatening a public official, all different sorts of stuff. And this is the kind of stuff that needs to happen in, in situations like this. There is no excuse for this. Yeah, why she thinks that she can get up and say this anyway, I can't imagine. Like, what went on what, in her why, head? Why, why would she not think that? What happens lately to people who do these sorts of things? Nothing happens Nothing. to right. them. There's no consequence. There's zero consequence. So it, it's one of those things that has to be addressed. There's no doubt. But we're seeing more and more of this go further and further and further. And believe me, we have a history in this country. In the 1970s, we had bombings all over the country when people thought they could could bomb, you know, various installations and various causes, people and locations that they didn't like. Okay, we're, we're heading in the wrong direction on this, and it needs to be dealt with, no doubt. All right, one other big story before we get to our video of the day. Okay, you heard about the story of the NPR, yeah. the guy from NPR, yep. Yuri Berliner. He Speaking writes, of media, I don't know, what is this, like pressure on the media to yeah. do what... 
do what I need you to do. Don't actually report the news or what I, I I'm still trying to get a feel for this guy. Well, he wrote a 3000 word article uh, for Barry Weiss's outfit and, and, and wrote some interesting things. So clip 36 else. It says uh, it's true that NPR has always been and had a liberal bent, but during most of my tenure there, an open-minded curious culture prevailed. We were nerdy, but not knee jerk activist or scolding in recent years. However, that has changed Today, those who listen to NPR or read our coverage online find something different, a distilled worldview of a very small segment of the U.S. population. And he goes back and he says, back in 2011, although NPR's audience tilted to the left, it still bore resemblance to America at large. 26% of the listeners describe themselves as conservatives, 23% is middle of the road, 37% is liberal. By 2023, only 11% were conservative, 21 middle of the road, 67% of the listeners were very or somewhat liberal. So he laments this and says, yeah. we lost our mission. We went and jumped on things like the Russia story with, with Adam Schiff, and we believed everything Adam Schiff said. And then all of a sudden, none of it turned out to be true, and we just dropped it and moved on. Right? He goes through a bunch of different things. Yeah. So NPR has a response. Their response was, we're going to suspend we're this gonna guy, suspend you. which is unbelievable to me that this is what he has every right. I mean, I understand when you disparage a company, they might have some sort of, you know, issue that they have to take. But instead of like responding properly, yeah. that's what's so ironic about this is basically they're being told, hey, you need to lean your stories this way. This guy's coming out and saying this is what we're, you know, we used to be more even balanced. We're not anymore. And instead of letting this guy say, hey, you know what? We do need to step back and evaluate the kind of stories we're putting out, making sure they're more balanced. We're going to punish the guy who actually had his <laughs> freedom of speech. Well, and it didn't last long because here's the latest headline. NPR editor resigns after publicly criticizing coverage, calls the new CEO divisive. The new CEO is... She has a laundry list of tweets, super activist sort of things going after. Let's get the activists all running our right, media. Right. I mean, on either side of the aisle, let's get the activists because that's well. Where- <laughs> and if you know what you're getting, if you know you're gonna go in, you're gonna go to MSNBC. Right. We, we know what you are. Right. I get that. You read you, the New York Times. You know what you're gonna get. Well, pretty much. True, true. But NPR is publicly funded. Right. So there's a difference here, and, and there should be a different standard. But unfortunately. There's not going to be. After this, it appears they're going to take the exact wrong lesson, which the, the the right lesson would be, yes, let's we do have to reevaluate our coverage. We do have to be more balanced. It's going to help your bottom line, by the way. There's a lot of competition in the far left for being far left news organizations. <laughs> Turns out there's a lot of them. And so you're trying to split a very small pie. It turns out if, if you are able to give a more balanced news product, I think you do very, very well. And again, I don't think there's a single conservative who thinks NPR is ever going to be a conservative news outlet, but anything even touching balanced would be would be a relief. Not going to get that. He's now gone. We'll see where he ends up. Yeah, hopefully he lands in some great outlet or somebody picks him up and says, hey, you know, we could use some of your side of. Well, Barry Weiss too. might with the free press. I mean, that's yeah. what she's doing there. That and that's I mean, again, she was at The New York Times. Barry right. Weiss was. And, and, and she, goes. she walked away. And she's so, gone. Yeah. yeah. There's yep. a reason that she walked away. So yes, keep that there in mind. is. All right. One more story. I get a little weather nerd for you. I know. This you is pretty this crazy. Video? Have you seen this video? OK, so in Dubai, their average yearly rainfall is about three inches a year. Uh, two days ago, they got five inches. And this is in what, a single day. In a so they single got day. Their annual rainfall in one day. Yeah, uh, almost double their annual rainfall. Oh, almost double. Okay. Yeah. And so this is what it looked like at the airport in Dubai. And if I'm the pilot, I am freaking out oh. having my plane in that. I mean, so I don't know if they're, are they headed away from the gate? Are they headed toward? I can't totally tell. I think away from the gate. You can't possibly take oh, off in that no much way. water. How are you landing in? It's like you're landing in a lake. How do you land in that? No, I, you can't. You think you'd hydroplane? I mean, you'd just be like, <laughs> I don't God. Know. speaking I just... of hydroplane, uh, yeah, I mean, you could possibly. <laughs> but do... um, it's crazy. It's nuts. I mean, there's a foot and a half, two feet of water on the runway. Yeah, that's a, that's a crazy amount of rain. It was it's it's impressive video. So if you are uh, just listening to us, yeah, look go up check this it video. out. Yeah, yeah, it's impressive. just put in Dubai Airport rain, and yeah. it will it will be there for you. So okay, so again, coming up on Monday, we will have we're gonna 
jump in. A lot of people have written us for months about, hey, healthcare. can we talk about healthcare? Yeah, and yeah. you know, the healthcare situation, people are asking, why don't we? Ha- why is it so hard for us to get into doctors? Why are we losing doctors, not only in New Mexico, but other parts of the country? Yeah. And what is, you know, why is this? So mm-hmm. we have somebody, and we can't wait to share that information with you guys. So please join us back here on Monday. Have a great weekend out yeah. there. See ya. You've been listening to the No Doubt About It podcast. We hope you've enjoyed the show. We know we had a blast. Make sure to like, rate, and review. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at No Doubt About It Podcast. No Doubt About It. The No Doubt About It Podcast is a Choose Adventure Media production. See you next time on No Doubt About It. There is no doubt about it.